So far we've talked about single meta surfaces, moving from meta surfaces to what I would like to call meta system, where we can go if we have multiple surfaces. Why is that fancy? Because it turns out there's a lot of things you can do with it which you really cannot do with classical optics and also not with individual meta surfaces. My name is Falk Einberger, I'm the head of the uh, micro and nanostructure department at Frau on of IOF. And welcome to my talk. Um, so, let me see, now I go. Um, so I'll be talking about um, nanophotonics, about meta surfaces. I'll try to highlight some of the fields of applications where we believe these might help progress optics and photonics. And also about what comes beyond the single meta surface. Now let's first of all start out with the caveat. Meta surface belongs one of, to, to, to one of these kind of modern scientific terms which are both equally heavily used and undefined. Yeah? So if you ask 10 people in photonics what a meta surface is, you'll probably get 12 different answers. And I'll just try for today's uh, talk, stick with the simplest answer that is a meta surface is any kind of optically surface which is structured at slightly below or slightly above the wavelength of light in such a way that it molds the flow of light using diffractive effects. Um, the hype for meta surface is pretty much related to this concept I'm just showing you here on the slide. The idea that in electronics, yeah, when we have moved about 60, 70 years ago from building electronic elements made out of individual components and then we've moved on to wafer scale electronics, we've opened up the avenue to this tremendously long progress which brought us mobile phones, um, Twitter and the internet basically. Yeah? So the, the vision is really, okay, going on to the wafer scale, going on to the surface, using lithographic techniques as opposed to um, building optical elements from individual uh, uh, individual components would bring, bring about smaller solutions, cheaper solutions, but also solutions with more degrees of freedom and more functionality. How would that look like in optics and photonics? Well, I guess you all know what optical and photonical systems classically look like. I've brought you a picture or a sketch of a component here on the left hand side. That's an ordinary lens, of course. What does it do? It focuses light. Yeah. No, uh, no black magic involved here. And in nanophotonics, these structures typically look like these on the right hand side here. So what we have here, for example, is the surface active or the, the interferometric equivalent of a lens, which is typically called a meta lens. So what we have here is we have a glass wave and on the glass wave we have a layer of silicon and the layer of silicon is structured in a way that light which propagates through this layer acts very much as if it has been propagating through a lens. If you take an electron microscope and look into these structures, what you see here is that the surface is not flat. It has been structured, carefully sculptured into a series of these little silicon pillars and each of the silicon pillars, roughly the size of the wavelength of light, act like an antenna. They basically take light which is impinging onto the surface, convert that light into an excitation and then re-emit this light. And this process, in terms of its effectiveness, its angular properties, its polarization sensitivity, also its spectral characteristic and its phase shift can be engineered by carefully crafting the layout and shape of each of these individual nano antennas, which are sometimes also called meta atoms. Now, this, as you already see, yeah, fulfills the purpose of kind of making an optical element flat, at least to a certain degree, but it's also a very complicated way of doing so. Yeah? This thing is about 20 millimeter in diameter, which roughly means that there are around about 25,000 nano antennas in each direction. Yeah? So as a whole, this thing consists of about a billion or so nano elements. So, Although the meta lens is probably the most, let's say, prominent, um, um, uh, the, the most prominent uh, component of the meta surface, I shall, for the remainder of the talk, argue that this is probably not a good way to go for initial solutions, simply because 
we have to build rather complicated elements to compete with elements which are basically extremely well crafted, well engineered and come fairly cheaply. Yeah? So I say, okay, for the remainder of this talk, let's no longer talk about the meta lens simply because we know how to focus light, we know how to kind of build these waveforms in a much more cheap and also more powerful way using ordinary lenses. So what do we do instead? Why are meta surfaces instead still interesting? Yeah? And I would like to argue that there are two particular directions which at least we believe are interesting for meta surfaces. That is one basically going into the direction of larger systems, yeah, because system size does not scale very well, at least in terms of lenses, going all the way from these kind of individual elements to wafer scale elements, uh, which you will see in a few minutes, and then also going to systems which kind of try to implement functionality that you cannot implement in classical optical systems. Yeah? So basically go big or go complex or do both, as you will see in the last part of the talk. So let's first of all think that discuss about going big. Let's first of all discuss about how we can kind of take the concept of meta surfaces, uh, uh, which is discussed in countless papers, yeah, and frequently fabricated on scales of, I don't know, 100 by 100 microns, and really scale it up to the size that, that such that they are usable in optical systems. Yeah? So the next chapter will really be about the fabrication of optical nanostructures um, from individual elements all the way to the wafer scale. And in doing so, we need to be very efficient. So our approach basically says, okay, let's take lithography tools, let's take nanostructuring tools, which we can use. Let's take them from the semiconductor industry and modify them in such a way that they become also efficient for the optical realm. Yeah? There's of course, however, a catch and the catch is there because um, electrons and photons are quite different beasts and it also means the nanostructures that you need to create in order to manipulate electrons, as in electronics, need to look quite different from those that you need uh, in order to manipulate photons. And one of the key differences, of course there are more, but one of the key differences here is really the size of these particles. Now to all the physicists in the audience, I'm using the term size here as a somewhat fuzzy concept. What I really mean is lateral coherence length. Yeah? Electrons are very, very small, which is a good thing because it means you can squeeze them into ever smaller um, circuitry. Circuitry which is now not bigger than, I don't know, fractions of tens of nanometers. This also however means that if you build electronic circuits, you need to be very, very careful about the resolution of your nanostructures, about the small features. Photons, on the other hand, typically at a wavelength of give or take a micron or so, yeah, have coherence length uh, uh, or, or C features, so to say, which are much larger than those features which can be seen by electrons. So hence you don't need to worry that much about the resolution about your of your nanostructures. But in particular if you go big, they can have an almost infinite coherence length. So what you need to worry about is not just the nanostructure of your system, you also need to worry about the way that these nanostructures interact at scale. Yeah? So in this term, nanostructure is actually somewhat of a misnomer in optics and photonics. It should be called nano and micro and macro structuring all at the same time. But of course, this would be a very long word, so we're not using it. And so it really comes down to basically not just resolution, as I said, but to three challenges that you have to overcome for these lithographic systems in order to be able to fabricate wafer scale nanophotonic solutions. I've already talked about resolution. Yeah? I've already argued about accuracy, which really means that if you build one little meta atom, one diffractive antenna on one side of a meta surface, and then build it on the other side of the meta surface. Yeah? These two need to be arranged in, uh, interfer with interferometric precision because otherwise the little wavelets that are emanating from this antenna will not interfere correctly in the far field. Another thing which is different as opposed to uh, electronic systems is that uh, photonic systems typically consist of a multitude of materials. Electronic has the very let's say, a um, fanciful situation that you can do pretty much with a reasonable quality in silicon. 
Whereas optics and photonics really is driven by new materials and is driven by the ability to combine materials into more functional systems, as you'll also see later down the line. So let's move on from these kind of theoretical, um, uh, uh, let's say, ideas and see how we create such nanostructures in practice and how we implement these basic requirements. So the, uh, the centerpiece of our nanostructuring facility here at Fraunhofer IOF in Jena is an, um, a large-scale electron beam uh, a writing machine, which is derived from a semiconductor industry instrument. Um, looks like this. Yeah, of course, it's a vacuum instrument, so it looks a bit, let's say, uh, you can't really see much from the outside. Yeah, uh, It sits in a clean room, and what it can do, it can create nanostructures on up to 300 millimeter wafers. We're currently installing an upgrade, so in the future we can also do 300 millimeter squares, which is quite large for meta-optical elements. Um, you see a few parameters here, and the, uh, I guess the two important parameters here are that the minimum feature size is not really great when it comes in terms of electron beam lithography, yeah? but this has a lot to do with the fact that we rarely need this for, uh, for meta surfaces. However, what this machine is really good at is kind of fulfilling this requirement in terms of accuracy, namely the placement errors of element is very, very small. So if you say, place me an antenna at a certain point on my wafer, it really is there plus minus 10 nanometers. And it is also a very fast machine, which is implemented by these writing modes that I shall discuss in the next part of, uh, part of the talk. This is, of course, interesting for applications because you're not just writing a paper. Yeah? You're not just creating an element of, I don't know, 100 by 100 microns, which you can write for a day or two, then do a measurement, write a paper, and we're done, it, we're done with it. We really want to be able to create elements that we can then also ship to the customer. And then, of course, exposure time is a matter of cost, and we need to keep those low or at least lowish. Okay, what does various shape, shape, variable shape beam and cell projection modes mean? Um, in a normal um, electron beam writing machine, what you basically have is you have a circular aperture with an uh, electron optics, and then the circular aperture is imaged onto the uh, substrate where it exposes a photoresist. These machines can have very, very high resolution, but what you basically have to do is you have to write larger structures from this kind of small pencil here, yeah, which of course can take a very long time. What we have on top of this is two writing modes called variable shape beam, where we instead of writing a single point, we can write um, little squares or little rectangles of arbitrary shape. You'll see that later this is particularly interesting for one-dimensional nanostructures, also called optical gratings. Yeah? And we have a cell projection mode where we can basically have a selection of stamps a few thousand actually, and then we can project those stamps onto the surface and then really compose our surface out of little meta atoms and the shape of these meta atoms and encode it in these stamps. While this seems like a technicality, let me give you an example of what kind of dramatic impact this has, particularly in terms of the writing time. So what I brought you as an example here is um, and, and something we published last year. It's this 300 millimeter wafer here, which is, uh, at least as far as, uh, as we know, the largest meta service ever produced. And what it is, it's not a meta lens. As I told you, lenses are kind of not what we're doing in general. Yeah? It's a meta grating. So what we basically have is we have a, a variation of our meta structures along this direction of our wafer. And if you take an electron microscope and look onto that, so what you basically see is here, you have uh, uh, one unit cell of your grating and you basically see that uh, the unit cell is comprised of meta atoms which vary in terms of their size and their sparsity basically from one end of the unit cell to the other end of the unit cell. So this is made of silicon and of course you need to expose this pattern which fills the entire wafer. So in this case this is about a hundred billion antenna which need to be written which is a whole lot if you have to write them individually with your point writer. We created the structure really to demonstrate the capability of these different writing regimes. And um, of course, there's a, there's a larger selection of, of, of kind of investigations here, but I'm just going to show you these two examples here. So first is a simulation of what would happen if we would use this variable shape beam, kind of this square, variable square aperture to create these 
100 billion round pillars. And of course, that's not a good match, right? Creating a structure which composes of small round things from large square things does not really work well. And so this immediately would mean that you would write about five, uh, sorry, 6,000 days or 20 years on the structure, which is of course not doable and not fundable and uh, yeah, plain impossible. If you however use the cell projection technique, you can out of our selection of many, many thousand stamps, you can actually select um, arrays of, uh, of, uh, of nanoatoms which are hard coded into that stamp mask yeah, and then create these structures very, very quickly. And in our case, this means basically that we go from 7,000 days exposure time down to one and a half days of exposure time. So a speed up of a factor of 5,000, uh, which I believe is quite dramatic. So the message I'm trying to convey here really, it's not just about having an electron beam tool which can create these large structures with this high precision and high accuracy. It's also about using it in such a way that um, you can create these structures in a cost efficient way and also designing them in such a way that you end up with structures that can be fabricated with ease. Do we just have cells here which have these little round dots here? Of course not, right? We have many, many more structures. So basically you can start to think about nano optical systems which are composed of meta atoms of various different shapes and functionalities. So another example here is of course again these are round meta atoms. We have meta atoms here which consist pretty much of concentric circles. We have square meta atoms. We have uh, uh, meta atoms which have a, a certain handedness and of course that's not just interesting in terms of the way what it looks like but what these do is basically based on their symmetry they address different properties of light. So I guess the easiest example is this one here, which will of course have a different impact if you have left hand or right handed circular polarization of light. So really you have a lot uh, of, uh, of degrees of freedom and the machine that can basically, um, uh, let's say, translate the ideas of these meta surfaces, which consist of an arrangement of meta atoms onto, the, onto scale. On the right hand side, there's a little example here, which is not really a meta service, but really just shows to highlight how flexible this approach is. And uh, we can actually use this machine as a microscale typewriter, which can uh, basically type roughly two million letters uh, a second. Yeah? And with this, uh, we uh, can basically fit the entirety of the German Wikipedia onto a half 300 millimeter wafer and still have some space left for, I don't know, your signature or so. The proper selection of the writing mode, however, is not just a matter of time. It is also something which is deeply related to this ability of photons to sample small and big structures due to its range of coherence lengths. And here you can see an example. And what we've done here is we've created an hexagon. Yeah? An hexagon is basically the equivalent of a lens, but it doesn't have a parabolic shape. It has a, an angular shape. And what it does is it redistributes light, light into a ring. And we've written it once with our um, uh, variable shape beam approach and once with our uh, character projection approach. And if you look at the um, electron beam images of the final structure, yeah, at the point where those, uh, let's say, we do not have the red mark, with your eye, you can basically so you see no difference. You would say, okay, both of these structures are equally good. Now you can have light propagate through that. And in the far field, you in fact observe a wildly different behavior. The character projection written one has your perfect distribution of light, mostly all light in this ring as you want to have it from an hexagon, whereas your a variable shape beam has a lot of stray light, a lot of diffraction ghost, as we would like to call it. And the reason is very simple. What you create is you create a mixture of long and short range correlation through the usage of these uh, stems, which have a particular symmetry. And there are some special wave factors, basically, where this correlation then in the end shows up in the far field. So the message here is it's not just enough to look at electron beam pictures if you ever create meta surfaces. It's not just enough to look at the scanning electron image of a small section of your meta surface. You really need to worry about how any kind of 
surface variations to do any kind of structures are correlated on the larger scale because this will in the end show up in your optical system. While this may seem like a little bit of an artificial example, this can actually be quite dramatic. I'm going to show you another example of an, an electron beam mask which we just pulled out of the electron beam machine. And this is supposed to create an almost perfectly somewhat irregular but rather homogeneous waveform. So the expectation is you take it out of the machine, yeah, so this is a 9 inch mask length, and what you will see is more like a homogeneous distribution of rainbow colors. But what you really can see, if you look closely, you can see these kind of sections here. And these are not in the data. These sections have been created because the machine has changed its writing strategy along these little sections. So here it has a slightly different writing strategy as opposed to here in order to fit the rectangles of the variable shape B mode onto the specific symmetries of the structures there. On the uh, scanning electron beam tool, these structures look totally identical. You, you cannot see a difference between here and here. However, the symmetry is slightly different and hence you have different long-range correlations and this is what your eyes see. So with these particular structures, you can actually do nano-analysis with your eyes yeah, at a level that surpasses the capability of scanning electron microscope tool, which is quite fancy, I believe. But long story short, this means that just having an electron beam tool is not enough really to make good meta surface and good optical systems out of meta surfaces. You need to really be able to understand the complete process chain and make the right decisions starting from the design over the fabrication all the way to the application. Okay, let's however go away from the fabrication and let's look at a few examples to give you an impression of what you can do with meta surfaces. And I'm starting historically also with a very simple example. Let's start with the grating. Yeah, I guess you all know optical gratings, what they basically do is they uh, basically disperse light according to their wavelength. Typical grating would look like this. You have a unit cell and then a blaze along the unit cell. What we created a few years back, actually done by my predecessors yeah, before my time, is they created a meta surface which mimics such a blaze by having a sub-wavelength structure of glass where the amount of glass changes in the unit cell. So you have a lot of glass here. This is here, this big fat uh, bright gray line and little glass here. So these are kind of these pillars here and then no glass here. And if light passes through that, these structures are so small that light just sees an average refractive index. So for light which passes through this, this just works like a blazed grating, which has a very efficient and very low stray light spectral ordering. This particular device made in 2010. Yeah? Uh, funnily enough, the term meta lens was introduced in 2013 by Federico Carpasso. Yeah? And so this is basically a meta surface which is older than the name. It's not just this, this is probably the most productive and most venerable meta surface ever made. This has been with the European Space Agency since 2010 and is on a space mission called Gaia since 2013, where it's helped basically creating uh, uh, star maps of, uh, of our galaxy. And it's contributed to roughly 400 papers so far. So this is a true science machine and uh, as such, probably the most prolific meta surface ever used. And um, of course you can create using this approach, all kinds of different gratings. So by combining these meta surfaces, these nanostructures, also with different materials. So the one I just showed you is made from pure glass. Yeah? You can also combine it with other dielectric materials, for example, in the form of layer stacks here. You have a high reflective and, uh, mirror and then a grating on top. And these systems are really well suitable for pulse compression gratings where you can have diffraction efficiencies uh, way above 99% over 100 or so nanometers bandwidth, which is really good for a uh, laser pulse compression. You can also add the different materials, not just beneath the grating, but also into the grating using techniques such as atomic layer deposition, as is done here. We have a few silica grating, which is filled with the titanium dioxide, tantalum oxide and silicon dioxide and nanostructure. And this is done here to really increase the refractive index difference and tune the polarization performance and also the bandwidth performance of uh, spectrometer gratings and this particular one uh, picture is taken from a project which we are doing at this moment where we are building um, basically a spectrometer instrument to 
uh, measure the carbon dioxide uh, distribution on Earth in almost real time. The uh, mission is supposed to be starting two, me two years from now. Going on from these simple structures and kind of latching on to the idea of using multiple materials, yeah, uh, as I said, it's not just about the structures, it's also about the materials and it's about your ability to basically etch into those materials with very high quality. Um, this would be worth its own talk in its own way. I'm just going to glance over this here, yeah? But it's really not just about glass. It's not just about silicon, which is really good for the near-infrared. This is also about high refractive visible materials such as titanium dioxide. This is about using materials which have extremely broadband uh, performance and capabilities such as diamond. And also about materials which are electro-optically active, which you can tune, switch and modulate, such as lithium niobate. And the challenge really is to combine this nanostructuring technologies and together with these multi-material platforms to achieve the functionality that you need for your application. Okay, now that we know how we can make large and fairly simple nanostructures, now let's move on to more complicated nanostructures and also more unusual designs going away from the lenses and the gratings. So one type of structures uh, of diffractive elements which we make, which is fairly well known, are so-called computer-generated holograms. Think of a computer-generated hologram like something of a really extremely deformed lens, yeah? something which is no longer circular but has some kind of weird face function over the surface. And what are these used for? We very frequently use these for uh, so-called uh, null CGHs. These are used as interferometric reference element for large optical uh, uh, instruments. Yeah? Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but what we do there is basically we create arbitrary wavefronts with extreme precision by translating the high accuracy and high resolution of our device into high accuracy and high resolution wavefront shaping. So this is what the slide basically says. Yeah, if you have a low positional accuracy, you can in general also shape very precise wavefronts with less than uh, uh, fractions of tens of nanometers of deviation. And what is this used for? This is typically used to align and uh, test uh, complex optical systems such as large mirrors or large telescopes. And the most spectacular one we've done in the last year is basically the uh, null CGH, so the reference element for the M2 mirror of the European Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, that's a rendering of the mirror here. So the mirror is uh, 4.2 meters in diameter. It's the largest convex element, uh, convex optical mirror ever built by humanity. Yeah? And it's not just big, it needed to be polished to extreme precision for this EELT to really work. Yeah? So what we then did is we basically created the reference element to it and with this computer generated hologram and basically this mirror is then tested and tested again until it's ground and, and basically shaped to the target shape. And this is really done with a precision of a nanometer, a bit more than a nanometer over the entire 4.2 meter shape and has required us to basically create a reference element with a wavefront error of much, much less than a nanometer. But you can see that this, uh, that this, this uh, piece of cake, yeah? uh, that's what it looks like to me, um, basically really fulfilled this requirement. And on the other end, you cannot just make small and very precise modifications to any waveform. You can also make fairly dramatic modifications to the waveform, for example, for classic diffractive beam shaping. I've brought you two examples here. I'd like to speak about the rightmost one, near yeah, the structure which can be seen here, which is basically a beam splitter which turns a single incident laser beam into an array of dots. And if you look closely, these areas of dots are basically non-periodic, periodically spaced. Yeah, so they are not located on a grid. They are all over the place, and uh, they have a very high signal-to-noise ratio and also a very high opening angle of 150 degrees. So it's really something where you have a single element, you have a laser coming in, and then you have 400, sorry, 4,000 and no, 1,900 um, individual beams coming out with very high precision all at more or less arbitrary but uh, predefined directions. We can of course also do meta lenses, discussed this quite frequently before, yeah, so I'm not going to go into details now. And we can also do more 
let's say, funky systems. Uh, we can create meta surfaces which are highly refractive, yeah? where basically all the waves which are propagate interfere destructively. And because everything which is propagating through interferes destructively, then of course everything needs to be reflected. Uh, and so this is an example of a mirror which is made from pure silicon, silicon and air, and has more than 99.5% reflectivity. The record as we speak is by 99.98 or something like that. That's what the mirror looks like. And this is really an interesting and new way uh, of, of uh, say, building mirrors of single elements, which for example, operate in very harsh conditions where there are just very few materials which survive in those conditions. You can also do exactly the opposite, you know, not preventing uh, interference, but kind of supporting interference. Yeah? And then, can, for example, do broadband anti-reflection coatings using these nanostructures. This is particularly interesting, as in this case, when you have diamond, which has this extreme um, um, transparency range where classic uh, quarter, wave, um, uh, quarter wave interference stacks uh, don't, uh, you know, cannot really hold up to the transparency range of the diamond. So far we've talked about single meta surfaces. And that's basically also what a lot of the community does. So it's very simple. What actually happens if you put more, if, if you integrate those meta surfaces, if you have multiple meta surfaces and try to manipulate light using multiple of these meta surfaces, moving from meta surfaces to what I would like to call meta system. On the simplest level, this can be a direct integration on the wafer with, for example, camera chips, yeah, as is done here, where we have a combination of micro lenses and color filters, diffractive color filters, yeah, which are basically some integrated onto a wafer of single photon sensitive cameras. But this is not really where I would like to go. I'd really like to understand or like you to understand where we can go if we have multiple surfaces. And this is actually a very old idea. Yeah? It was coined by Abel himself. Um, well, of course, he did not know the term meta surface and he did not dare think about the kind of complex optical surfaces which we made. But he found the Abel's sign condition. And in very simple term, what Abel's sign condition says is, well, if you want to have a fancy optical system, you need to distribute its functionality onto many optical surfaces. Yeah, of course, he used the word lenses because that's the only optical surface which really was available in the 1850s. But it's true for any kind of surface. Yeah? So there's something we can learn from other, uh, from 180 years ago um, about meta surfaces, which is quite cool. So what do I mean with this is if you take a classic optical system, such as an imaging system and a microscope objective, yeah, it gets its resolution or if you'd like to call it optical process power, from distributing its functionality over many optical surfaces. Yeah? And which gives you more power, but also challenges in terms of design, lens fabrication, lens adjustment. Now, let's assume we can do this with meta surfaces. Yeah? So let's assume that we can stack many, <laughs> many meta surfaces behind each other and kind of harness more optical processing power from this approach. Again, we have a, a, a challenge in designing these elements, in fabricating and adjusting these elements, which here, of course, needs to be done with interferometric precision. Let's answer questions or let's answer challenges two and three first, because we actually believe that this is much easier than you think. Remember, we have mastered the art of creating large meta surfaces. So we can't just create large individual meta surfaces, we can create wafers of many meta surfaces, different meta surfaces sitting next to each other, which are interferometrically aligned to each other due to the highly precise fabrication process. And then what you can do is you can take an ordinary mirror and have light bounce over your surface one, through the mirror, over surface two, through the mirror, over surface through, three, and out the mirror again. And what you now have is you basically have a monolithic system that mimics exactly this functionality here. Why is that fancy? Because it turns out there's a lot of things you can do with it which you really cannot do with classical optics and also not with individual meta surfaces. This is a demonstrator or this is a video taken from a, a demonstrator which we had at the laser trade show last year. And what you see here is the action of this element. Yeah? 
which has eight little meta surfaces next to each other. And then there was a mirror in installed in front of it, and the light kind of bounces over these eight surfaces consecutively. And on one side, you see a camera image of the input and the other side of the output. And this video should now play, does it? Okay, and you see basically, if you change the direction of input light, yeah, you get out different Gauss Hermite modes depending on which direction you're coming in. So what this was designed for basically is to take a fiber which has seven different cores, yeah, and then depending on light which is coming from which core, it would be converted into a different Gauss Hermite mode. And this may seem like a bit of an arbitrary example, but this was basically for optical data communication where we have a bits basically encoded in the location in the core to be propagated through a fiber, and then bits um, encoded in the Gauss Hermite mode to be propagated in free space. And this conversion is done with a single element um, pa entirely passively and completely coherent without needing any kind of power requirements. This is really just the simplest kind of case you can imagine. and We can make this more complicated. And so what we had is we had a, a, a student who kind of had the idea to say, okay, if, um, can I use these elements and train them the way that neural networks are trained in order to create a pattern recognition system? And this is exactly what he did. He trained a system just like this, in this case it consists of a few more layers but not so many more. Yeah? And then what he did is he trained the system to basically deflect input light onto certain sections of your detector depending if the input light is in the shape of a shoe or a shirt or a hat. Uh, there's actually databases of this categorization problems which you can download. I believe they have been taken at some point from Zalando. Um, yeah. So, and then what you can do is you can basically take this element and present this element an image of a shoe, yeah, and then most of the light will actually be routed to this part of your detector and you know that your camera sees a shoe, yeah. And this processing, this complex pattern recognition task is actually done all passively on the single photon level at the speed or at the delay that your light just needs to propagate through this, so at the level of just nanoseconds delay. So this is really now optical computing, yeah? pattern recognition on the physical limit of both computation speed as well as energy consumption. And we believe that this is a really, really exciting topic uh, for the future development of going from individual meta surface really to meta systems which can complete much more complex tasks than just imaging. Going from a system, optical system which do imaging to optical systems which can do part of the pattern recognition, part of the seeing task, if you like, all integrated passively in that system. So um, that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. I hope I have convinced you today that um, meta servers are very interesting. Yeah? Um, I hope that I've convinced you that we can really create meta servers using standard tools of lithography with, let's say, very high quality and at reasonable duration and speed and hence also with reasonable cost. Yeah. I have also shown you that this process has, uh, as we say in German, has a lot of devil in the details. So you have to take into account global, uh, local and global effects and you have to master a large palette of materials in order to really reap functionality of your meta surface. I hope I've shown you that and um, meta surfaces are not really a thing for future applications, but that as we speak, there are real world applications of meta surfaces. And it is really just a matter of rolling these out onto more and more applications. And last, in the last part of the talk, I hope that I have convinced you yeah, that um, the real power is in the system. The real power is in making use of one or many meta surfaces to make your optical system do more than it is capable with just uh, as if you just um, built out of classical optical elements. So thank you for your attention. Have a good one. <laughs>